in session one, you talked about Squid Games. We've all watched Squid Games on Netflix. It's, uh, <laughs> I think, that one of the most watched shows in uh, Netflix history. What did you mean about the conditions in Los Angeles around that 1992 time? Mm -hmm. Maybe even before Sun Jae Do and the Rodney King. Uh, sure. How was the conditions like Squid Games? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the the show Squid Game, um, the game master set a table in which again the the players the only way that they could come out with the final winning is hurting each other. But you know he allowed the the players to volunteer like they weren't forced, right? But where they were not forced, even though they were not forced, their economic challenges forced them to play in this game because they were going to go bankrupt, they were going to commit suicide. I mean, if they didn't get this winning, monetary winning, like all hell would have broken loose uh, in their life. And so in that way, they were very desperate um, and they decided to, you know, uh, basically join this game that put their life at risk, but also ended up hurting and killing uh, one another. And in the same way, first of all, um, in there's first of all this U.S. history where communities of color have really been left out of the uh, wealth building uh, investments. So, for example, the U.S. government, um, I forgot the exactly, but basically we're giving out land and, you know, horses and things like that, uh, that allowed a lot of white people to be able to build you know, wealth, right, and have land ownership. But then also after the war, uh, the veterans, uh, again, white veterans, were given the opportunity to buy homes, right, um, that allowed them to, um, to reduce, you know, special interest rates and special, um, again, parameters that allow them to become homeowners and their wealth continued to increase. Whereas with, um, you know, uh, basically African-American, other communities of color veterans did not get that same opportunity. Not only that, but basically um, in terms of they were landlocked, they could only buy homes in certain neighborhoods. And as such, the home value, and also they would not give out loans. And so in that way, each time you buy and sell, the home value tends to go up, right? But if you cannot buy and sell, your home value stays locked at the original price, right? So for the people who were, uh, you know, Caucasian, they were able to build wealth. Um, and the vast majority of middle class uh, in this country gain wealth through homeownership. There's even today, there's a $200,000 difference in wealth between homeowners and lent, uh, renters. So there was that dimension. Uh, but in addition, a lot of the big companies, and I'm trying to recall um, what the impetus was, but a lot of the big well-paying pay, companies um, moved out. Um, and so again, the communities that were left behind, particularly in the African-American community suffered and there wasn't a source of income. So again, there was all that tension, lack of wealth, lack of access to job opportunities, et cetera. And at the same time, um, the Korean community, um, I mean, there's lo the larger immigration hi history, but the 1965 Immigration Act, right, allowed immigrants, especially from Asia, who were prevented by legislation from coming into the United States, were finally allowed to come into. So there was the influx. And the part of the influx came from, again, poverty in our war-torn war uh, home countries, right? So people left their homeland, left their safety net to come to a new country in pursuit of the American dream. But particularly for the Korean community, they had high language barriers. Right. And what business, what job opportunity, their whatever past degrees, it was irrelevant. It was not acknowledged in the United States. So many of them sought opportunities in uh, businesses. Right. And so where could they afford when they had very little income? And South Korean government only allowed what to people to bring one hundred dollars per family member. Right. So my family with, you know, five individuals, we only brought $500 to survive in the United States when you really don't have any connections, et cetera, right? So again, a lot of these immigrants really like worked hard to save a little bit of money 
to go buy businesses and you know they can't buy it in beverly hills or Center city you know they're going to be able to afford businesses in probably you know poor neighborhoods and so in that way there was that conflict in terms of many of these store owners were um you know buying convenience store or liquor stores or beauty beauty supply stores and you know there's no security. All the goods are sprawled out. <laughs> the police don't respond. The people in the community want those goods. And so it really creates this very, like, what is it? A, an environment in which tension and violence, right, could occur. And there was a lot of suspicion. And I think there was a narrative that's being told that these Asians or Koreans were getting special money uh from government that was not being given to the black community and so in essence that they were um taking advantage or really stealing business opportunities that belong to the african-american community um and at the same time again there's been this um long period in which the african-american talked about police brutality but no one believed them and 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 it's true that and, and with the rodney king um situation it was caught on video for the first time and so they really felt the black community felt that they would get their vindication finally right but when the verdict came and the police did not get any jail time um you know i could see a certain level of anger uh, arising from the black community and on top of that, as mentioned, the that tension of the Korean store owner, right, selling goods and having it all sprawled out, and there's poverty in the community, there's violence in the community, um, having that interaction without any police protection, any kind of interaction. And again, many of these immigrants, they're thrown into a situation, they're working very long hours, Right, um, and it's a highly traumatizing environment. It, it's the second most dangerous job of being killed while working. So again, um, very little English skills, very vulnerable, right? And you're working long hours, no vacation. And so it's really a setup where they're not going to be the most friendly <laughs> people. Again, it doesn't excuse them, but then also the constant, you know, um, theft shoplifting, gun violence, also kind of put the store owners in a very desperate situation in which they, you know, out of despair, without any protection, end up, you know, following certain individuals <laughs> who look like they're about to take them um, as well. So again, it was, it's a very unfortunate situation that has created this tension. Wow, thank you for <clears throat> really helping us to understand um, like before the flashpoint, whether it's kind of like the context of what was happening in the 1990s, but I think you went even further back when you talked about like who could even come to the United States, who could even buy houses, who could even get loans. Uh, and uh, and there were some who just even actually just got land. I think it was like you mentioned um, the Homestead Act of 1862. It's like if you... <laughs> If you you could you you could just get 160 acres, you know, and that's if, right. Well, that's what it was. I can't remember the details, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so imagine if you were the person that got 160 acres, and then you passed on right. to your descendants and your descendants, and you talked about that wealth building that some were able to tap into, where others not as much, and they're just struggling to survive, and it seems like there's no way to get get uh, gain wealth. Uh, yeah. That's kind of helping us to understand like how it was a little bit like squid games maybe 